I was extremely impressed with his demeanor. He never got flustered. He never got mad. Will was a nice guy, uh, sometimes to his detriment on the court. He was too nice a man. I can't tell you how many times I watched him go up for a dunk and someone would put their hand within the cylinder trying to block a shot and Wilt would let up because he knew he could break the man's arm. Chamberlain won seven straight scoring titles, 11 rebounding crowns, and two championship rings. Yet, for most of his 14 seasons, he played in a shadow of perfection cast by the press. He's had a lot of terrible things said about him uh, uh, because he didn't win more. Will Chamberlain will forever be defined for his failures, not his victories. It's his own fault. He had opportunities to change it, and he could never do it. Chamberlain was concerned about Chamberlain. He was in love with his stats. I think showing his peers that he could score 50 a game, that he could get 24 rebounds, that he could get eight assists, I think that was enough for Wilt to say, look, they're, they're the numbers. He was so great that no matter what he did, people never accepted it as being enough. If you look at his records and the records that he set, I always thought it was like watching him in slow motion. I thought he could have even done more. If you win, everybody says, well, look at him. He's that big. If you lose, it's how can he lose a guy that size? I think it's confused him. He would have been better in an individual sport. He'd have been much better just competing for himself. He wanted to kill. And this guy was five or six inches bigger than Russell, was 70 pounds. Heavier than Russell, was very skillful at what he did. The first time we played Wilt, Wilt destroyed Bill Russell. Put enough fear in Bill Russell's heart that Russell was going to do anything to beat Wilt. The only difference between the two of them was the fire in the belly. If he had one third of, of Russell's intensity, God, he would have been even more awesome than he was. Ultimately, of course, we get to the fact that he couldn't sink free throws. He loved to say that he could sink shots from outside as well as Jerry West or Gail Goodrich or somebody he was playing, which was perfect nonsense. But that was important for him because, you see, that wasn't a function of size. But then you'd ask him, well, if that's true, well, why can't you shoot a free throw? And he didn't have an answer. The germ of Wilt Chamberlain's foul line affliction had been planted back in Kansas. A 62% free throw shooter with the Jayhawks, Wilt, by 1968, was missing more than 6 of 10 from the strike. I mean, he tried underhand, sideways, you know, almost back to the top of the circle, and just never could do that. But yet, in practice, he could sit there and make 7 out of 10. I think if Wilt really concentrated on it and he had a little help from somebody who could shoot fouls and, and instruct him like a golf pro he could have been a better shooter one game earl strom the great referee was working the game and wilt got a, a foul called on him he's on the way to the line and he turns and then the most if you can imagine a seven foot three incher speaking in a pitiable voice he said earl earl tell me help me why can't I make a free throw? Against the Celtics in the 1968 Eastern Division Finals, the 76ers blew a three games to one lead. In their four-point loss in Game 7, Chamberlain was less than dominant, shooting four for nine from the field and six of 15 from the foul line. It was his last game as a 76er. Well, despite such mutual dislike, the Lakers took the Celtics into the seventh game of the 1969 Finals. Trailing by seven points, Chamberlain took himself out with 5.19 left in the fourth quarter. Wilt's knee was really paining him, and he just wanted to quiet it down for a couple of minutes, and he came out and he put some ice on it. So when the knee quieted down a little bit, Dipper said to me, tell the man I'm ready to go back in. And Van Brennikoff said, tell him to hell with him. We don't need him. If I remember correctly the words I said, and I've said them often enough, so we're playing better without you. 
Coach Van Bredekoff and Wilt did not get along at all. I think Van Bredekoff would have been thrilled to win a championship with Wilt sitting on the bench. But the Lakers lost 108-106, and in the aftermath, Chamberlain suffered a blow that would hurt long after his knee recovered. Compliments of his chief adversary who had played his last game. Russell called him a faker, that he wouldn't stay in uh, during the game. Russell gave him a little needle after that. He should have played as a seventh game. Russell couldn't understand it, but in that moment, you, uh, when all is on the line, you wouldn't go back in the game. You know, it was a foreign idea to him. Chamberlain can't move. He really twisted that knee. Game seven in the 69 finals. Will got injured in the second half, he ended up playing. And this could be a big factor in the closing minutes of this game. And for the first time, you were critical about, yeah, about uh, it. What happened was I was speaking in a college in, in Nebraska, I think, and there was a reporter and the guy there with the students. Oh, and you didn't know there was a reporter there? And he says, you wouldn't have won if Will hadn't got hurt. And I was annoyed. And I said, if I got hurt and so I couldn't play, they'd have to take me straight to the hospital. And you guys didn't talk for years. Yes. But a couple of years later, I had a chance that we were alone. I looked him in the eye and I said, I apologize. With Russell gone in 1970, the path to the NBA title was rerouted through Madison Square Garden. When Knicks center Willis Reed went down with the knee injury in game five, the way to glory seemed open for Wilt and his talented supporting cast. They somehow rallied together in the fifth game with no one on the floor taller than 6-7 in the second half and beat the Lakers to go up 3-2. Take themselves back to Los Angeles. Wilt asserts himself with 45 points and 27 rebounds against hapless Nate Bowman, taking us all back to New York with everyone wondering, can Willis play or can't Willis play? A couple of Knicks come out, they begin to shoot. A couple of more come out, and I'm watching Wilt, and he keeps looking at the guys that came out. He's looking for Willis Reed, and suddenly there is this incredible roar and here comes Willis, and the crowd is going wild. I saw West, I saw Chamberlain, I saw Baylor stopping their tracks because the both teams were warming up, and they were just staring at Reed. And I said to myself at that point, man, I think we got these guys. Frazier then slows it down, is picked up by Jerry West at the top of the post, Reed. In the end, Willis Reed's two baskets in 27 minutes counted more than Chamberlain's 21 points and 24 rebounds as the Lakers went down 113-99. What Russell says is, if I had been playing Willis Reed, I would have gone right at it. I would have never played harder in my whole life. I would have asked for the ball every time down. I would have put it to him. I, if he tried to shoot, I'd have been right in his face and knocked it down. And Wilt was sort of intimidated. Wilt didn't want to be the bad guy. He knew the whole world was cheering for Willis Reed. He may not have had the killer instinct at certain moments to go after somebody's knees, to go after somebody's weakness. Dispirited by his failure to reach the top, Chamberlain decided to quit the NBA and looked elsewhere for victory, professional boxing. Customato told In sports, they always say that will overcomes skill. And I think that when you have that kind of clash of titans, it's the will and the mind of Russell that will always dominate. He wanted it more. But it wasn't a matter of Wilt versus Russell with Bill. He would let Wilt score 50 if we won. The thing that was most important to him was, you know, championships, rings, and winning. When